So I'm hugely pleased to invite John Hayes to, uh, <laughs> to, to say a few words, if that's okay. Uh, that's excellent. Um, I think we'll have 10 minutes from John and a, a quick Q&A, and then we'll, we'll hand over to the panel for comments. Very good. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, and uh, particularly good to be back at Microsoft and with Policy Exchange, a, a wonderful amalgam. Um, the government's macroeconomic policy it has two pillars. The first pillar, the reduction of the deficit, gets a lot of the headlines, and rightly and understandably so. But the second pillar is about reshaping the economy to make it more resilient, to make it more sustainable. And central to that reshaping is recalibrating the skills of the workforce. We know from all kinds of analysis, international and national, that the skills of the British workforce are rather uh, less well-developed than they should be, certainly compared with France and Germany and the United States and other competitor countries. So to invest in skills is not just about providing opportunity for individuals. It's also about preparing our economy for a high-tech, high-skilled future, which is the only future that will allow us to grow and prosper. <coughs> Skills have a direct relationship with both productivity and competitiveness in these terms. So skills policy should be seen as crucial to, central to, macroeconomic policy. It is an imperative that business gains the skills it needs to compete and succeed. But of course, skills policy is about much more than that, too. The, uh, I was reading Hegel this morning. I like to read Hegel. I always read the Bible first, and then I move on from there. And, uh, and, and Hegel said that about is actualized by becoming something definite, by becoming something particular. And the particularity of gaining certain kinds of competencies, certain kinds of skills, allows people to grow because the esteem they feel and the esteem they gain from others elevates them. And the uh, truth is that we've allowed, because of the triumph of uh, bourgeois liberalism, which we mustn't go into in great detail, and I don't, of course, mean liberal democratism. I, I <laughs> made up with that Fortunately, many liberal Democrats are social Democrats. But the, uh, the, uh, the triumph of liberalism with a small L has meant that we've underestimated the value of practical learning. We've uh, assumed for a long time that the only way that people gain prowess and that kind of esteem comes through the acquisition of academic competencies, the understanding uh, that uh, uh, book learning is uh, more significant than what we do with, uh, in technical or vocational or practical terms. This seems to me to be absolutely unhelpful, both to the economic imperative I described and to the social need to give everyone their sense of value so that all feel valued because each feel valued. So the mission, which I have, is not merely, not merely a mission to deliver the kind of economy we want, big though that is. It's also socially transformative because it will allow all of those with technical and vocational and practical tastes and talents to at last have their place in the sun, their chance of glittering prizes. This will not only fuel social mobility, as we know, for example, that when people do apprenticeships, they gain a better chance of keeping a job, getting a job, prospering a job. The average uh, wage for an apprentice that uh, achieves a level three qualification over an earning lifetime is 100,000 more than someone that doesn't. We know uh, that people who do apprenticeships, a massive, by a massive proportion, uh, 80, 90 percent, know that they get value from them, and the businesses, by the same kind of token, 90 percent, say they get value from apprenticeships. We know that uh, in equipping people with these skills, we will match what the most effective of our competitors have done already, have committed to, for, in some cases, a very long time. So the mission that I'm engaged in is about economic renewal and social renewal. And understanding the mix of those two 
rather like the glorious mix I described between Microsoft and Policy Exchange, is to understand the salience, the significance of our skills policy. Well, you might reasonably ask, against that big picture, what have the government so far achieved? And I simply say these three things to allow maximum time for others to contribute. We, first of all, have set out a very clear strategy, the clearest still strategy I think that any government can claim, which I did uh, when, we first became, when we f I first became a minister uh, at the end of 2010. That strategy sets a very clear direction of travel, identifies the destination we wish to reach, the kind of destination I've described to you briefly today, and uh, sends out a very powerful signal to business, to uh, providers of learning, colleges and so on, to individuals, to others, that this government regards skills as a significant, as a vital part of its agenda. Uh, to that end, we freed up further education colleges to a greater degree than ever before. Uh, further education colleges, curiously, were trapped in a kind of Stalinist control, command and control, a kind of dictate and provide system. We long ago accepted that universities need to be free to prosper. We increasingly accepted, including under the last government, by the way, that schools would do better if they had more discretion. And yet further education colleges were trapped in an extraordinarily kind of micromanaged, bureaucratic, Whitehall-driven system. I want to free further education colleges up, not because I have any uh, uh, either aesthetic or philosophical interest in freedom, but because I see freedom as a vital tool to allow them to become responsive, to employ a need and learn a choice, to allow them to become sufficiently dynamic to deal with the increasingly dynamic needs of an advanced economy. So we freed up FE colleges. And finally, as well as setting out our vision, as well as creating the mechanisms which will deliver that vision. We have invested record amounts in apprenticeships. And I, just for the sake of record, because uh, uh, you know, there are inevitably uh, critics. I mentioned the kind of bourgeois left earlier, uh, the PEC and others. Um, uh, there are undoubtedly critics. Just to be clear, we have made an unprecedented investment in quality as well as quantity. Never before has a government put into place statutory standards for apprenticeships, which we have. Never before as a government said that apprenticeship should, should be of a minimum duration, which we have. Never before as a government put such an emphasis on taking out poor provision in apprenticeships as we have. So the emphasis on quality to retain and build the, the nature of the brand, the recognition of the brand value, is just as important as delivering numbers. I can say with some confidence that by the end of this year, we will achieve 500,000 apprenticeship starts in Britain each year. I can say with confidence that by the end of this parliament, we will achieve 20 to 25,000 higher level apprenticeship starts. That's at first year degree level apprenticeship, level four <coughs> apprenticeship starts a year. Bear in mind when I became the minister, there were 180. 180. And we will have 20 to 25,000 starts a year. This is the most radical investment in practical learning in the spirit of Ruskin and Morris, but absolutely right for here and now that any government has ever embarked on. It will be a hallmark of this government's achievements. It will have the socially transformative uh, effects that I described. This is about economic and social renewal, and I'm very proud to be part of it. Thank you so much for listening to me. Yes, of course. I think, I think we'll take a, a couple of questions now before handing over to the other panellists. So, again, if you could just say your name and where you're from and then pose a, a question. Uh, we'll start, perhaps we'll take, we'll take the three that ha hands up. There's one there and then we'll go there. And we'll, no, you asked them before, so we'll go right in front of you first. So, just at the back there. Uh,
Yes, that, that's, a, that's an extremely... Um, I'm going to stand up because I, it's almost better to stand up, isn't it? Because um, you look more impressive standing up. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 look, and looks can deceive, can't they? Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the prior ten point, very good point. I think it's in two parts, actually. The, 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 I'm part of the problem that we inherit as a government. I, I don't say this is just about the previous government, actually. I think that's a bit vulgar. But part of the problem we have as a society is that still 40,000 people, roughly speaking, leave school each year, functionally illiterate and or enumerate. Now, you see, uh, at the end of the day, in an economy where the number of unskilled jobs is falling very rapidly, uh, Lord Leach, you remember the last government, predicted they would fall to something like half a million, which is extraordinary, really, when you think how many there were when I was a boy in the 1960s. Uh, given that, those, the people without those core skills simply won't be able to find employment unless we get them skilled up. So one of the things I've done in apprenticeship specifically to deal with your question directly is to insist that every... This is the first time this has happened, actually. To insist that every level two apprenticeship should lead towards uh, GCSE, English and Maths equivalent, so that um, we essentially use the apprenticeship system to uh, reinforce, if you like, this kind of skills you're speaking of, uh, even for those who perhaps start uh, without uh, the skills they should have gained at school. I think the second part of that is to make the system highly progressive. And, and I talked a little about higher level apprenticeships, which we've invested in, say, to, to a pretty remarkable degree. Um, when people see the apprenticeship system as a, as a highway, not as a cul-de-sac, when they see that they can genuinely move to higher level learning and uh, jobs that relate uh, to that, or that spring from that, I think that will change uh, the perception of apprenticeships and the reality of the rigour associated with them. But you're right, the apprenticeships must be ever more rigorous, which is why when I started down this road, I was very keen to ensure that we emphasise quality as much as quantity. Because there's always, when you grow a business, I mean, I used to be in the IT industry, Microsoft will know this very well, when you grow any part of a business, uh, there's always a tension between quantity and quality. And so unless you invest very heavily in quality at the same time as you're building the brand and creating the momentum, there's a risk you take on more marginal cases, more marginal businesses, more marginal providers, more marginal uh, apprentices. So I absolutely agree that rigour has to be the heart of the system. And what I've done on... Uh, core skills embedded in apprenticeships is part of that, of that mission. I'm going to Germany soon to have a look at Germany. I do, I do admire the German school system. I'm going with the TUC, uh, who I also admire, by the way, uh, as a trade unionist myself. Um, and I am very interested in how we can uh, learn from those countries that have, in that, that, case, that particular case, had a very long history in terms of delivering the kind of quality uh, in, in terms of vocational learning, you're right. But we've been too apologetic, haven't we, about vocational learning for years. Far too apologetic. Defensive. Almost guilty. I am mean, speaking to a very senior principal of an FE college who I've missioned to work on building the quality of teaching and learning in FE. And he's just establishing a commission, which I've uh, initiated. And he was saying this is the, the optimism just around the very fact that I've done that, the, the very fact that we are going to focus on the, on the quality of leadership and teaching and learning in FA has become uh, both, uh, both contagious and, and infectious, one might say, but also uh, he said it's extraordinarily wide, you know, widespread as a result. So contagion, I suppose, is widespread, but you know what I mean. Um, and, uh, and so I think being less apologetic about practical learning lies at the heart of the mission. Perhaps we can take... Okay, we take two, two more. Yes, and I'll kind of shorter back. answers. Um, there, was, there was one there, and then there's another question, perhaps the, uh, the arm at the back as well. So that one, and then just one there. Trisha. Hi, Tricia. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a bit about skills utilisation, following on from what you said there about growing the group and whatever, and about the links. Are, nobody doubts your commitment to, to developing skills, particularly developing higher level skills. Mm. Aren't we in danger if we don't get this in sync? Of having of ending up with an awful lot of graduates collecting supermarket trolleys and that kind of thing. How are we linking that into employment policy in such a way that we're making yeah, sure it, we don't demoralise a... young people in particular who've taken on board skills development and then don't have a means of, of using it? Well, I think by making the system operate as close to the market as possible, 
Um, I think I think that uh, we know, don't we, that that in the case of university graduates that you mentioned, but also in the case of vocational learners, that those who have the most vocational skills that are right in the groove where there's a market need or demand are the most likely to get a job, keep a job, progress in a job. So, so creating the the what you said the link, the relationship between real economic need and what we teach and test is critical. And the only way you can do that is to have a very demand-driven system. The last government, by the way, uh, certainly accepted that in theory. I mean, this is, not a, uh, this is not something that hasn't been accepted across the political spectrum. If you create... So perhaps with some business reflections on both the skills and employment and prospects for both of those in the future, Neil? Uh, Neil Carberry, Director of Employment Affairs at CBR. I'm going to stand. I was going to sit, but now I've been told I look more impressive when I'm standing <laughs> up. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to take the minister, minister's lead. Thanks, Matthew. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to offer a few remarks uh, this morning, and I, I think I'll start with our agenda for a, a, a jumping-off point that Matthew himself mentioned in his introductory remarks, and that's the interaction in our labour market between the cyclical and the structural. Three broad headings for what I'll say this morning. What do we know about what's going on in the British labour market? What are the strategies that we might take? And then turning to, I think, the reason I've been invited, what's the role of business in that agenda? Well, what do we know? Well, we know from the experience of the recession, it is probably true that we thought we'd solve the British labour market, as you've said earlier. Um, but if you look into the period across the last 15 years, it's pretty clear that there's some substantial structural issues in the labour market, and that's something the CBI pointed out in a report last year. Um, left alone, the benefits of growth, and growth is absolutely essential to resolving labour market difficulties at any, at any stage, and we strongly support uh, John's comments on the economy uh, uh, when he opened his uh, remarks we will see the same old story. The same old story is that the, the lowest skilled are always those that lose out. Long-term uh, uh, damage is generational. The trend of developing workless households is, um, is problematic and regionally uh, and locally clustered. And it'll be the youngest who have the toughest long-term effects from periods of un unemployment during recessions. That says that there is a role for a strong labour market strategy from government. All the more so because we know that jobs themselves will continue to evolve. What we think of as a job, there will be more demand at higher skill, uh, skilled levels. There will be more managerial roles. There will be more knowledge uh, worker roles. And even the less skilled work that we recognise will still exist will be more skilled than it is today. The really problematic part of this is that when you map future demand in the private sector over some of those trends that I've mentioned already towards workless households, towards uh, youth unemployment, towards low levels of current private sector uh, activity, they correlate very closely. So the need to have a strong strategy for rebalancing the economy, linking up with everything that the minister is doing, but also the work that Lord Heseltine is doing on, uh, um, over, the, over this year is absolutely essential. Our Director General has been very clear in this, that he sees skills as the critical long-term issue for Britain's com uh, competitiveness in the global economy. That's a very strong statement, but it's one which is bound up in everything the CBI is doing this, this year, and it's one of the reasons why, for instance, uh, my head of education and skills is spending his entire year full time on a piece of work on the UK's education system. <coughs> so what's the strategy for where, we, uh, for, for where we are today? Well, clearly there is a stock issue and a flow issue. The stock issue is a cyclical issue. It's about the level of unemployment today. There is a flow issue which is about resolving <coughs> the longer term issues that we see in the British labour market. On the stock side, the government's instincts are broadly right. Work is critical. Getting people into work, connected to work, understanding work, getting the first foot on the ladder, of course, paying attention to subsequent progression is absolutely essential. 
we're supporters of uh, the youth contract for, for, uh, for younger people. We think it's the right set of pol uh, policies. It, it must be said that it would be useful to have a to, for it to be simpler for smaller businesses to engage with. Support, uh, developing job centre pl uh, plus services, looking at welfare reform, these are all in principle the right thing to do. I would say that we, there has been a lot of change in this area over the last 12 months and I think we, will, we are going through a period of re-engineering in all of these services and it will be necessary to make tweaks and changes as we go along and we've been very pleased with the engagement we've had both with uh, Biz and with BWP on taking a practical approach to making sure support ser uh, employment support services are um, effective and when they hit the ground. The critical thing is that local brokerage in this, in skills, in uh, um, welfare to work services has to take place because the majority of businesses are not of the capacity that they have a national relationship with Job Centre Plus. They need single points of contact locally that allow them to pull in um, things which are relevant to their business and also enable them to play a greater role. On the flow side, I think we need to think very carefully about our educational performance and in particular the preparation that we give uh, to our young people. I, the CBI published a report last October uh, called Action for Jobs, uh, which was the result of a 12-month program of engagement with um, people inside and outside the business community from uh, focus groups with long-term unemployed people through uh, our first ever public call for evidence, through uh, work with a number of chief executives in membership who are running different programs. And that came up with three broad headings for action. One was about the skills system. Um, about, one was about uh, young people's position in the labour market. One was about education and business school links. I have to say that across the whole uh, gamut of that, the, play, the, the one area where we have broadly got not very far at all is in the nature of business involvement in the education system pre-16. Um, and I think too many of our young people are already on the wrong path by the time um, colleges um, job centres uh, get, uh, uh, get to see them. From that point of view, we would like to see more of that local brokerage helping pull uh, businesses, into school, uh, businesses into schools. And let's not be uh, bashful, there is a really big appetite in the business community to do this. It's just no one knows quite how to do it. At the moment, schools aren't particularly incentivised to get businesses involved. Why is this important? It's not important because the chief executive of a company coming in and talking about a company is, <coughs> is life changing. It may very well be important in lots of engagements. But actually, if you put someone into a school who looks like uh, uh, stu students in that school a few years on, talks like them, can articulate why what they are doing has a has an, a life outcome for them, why engagement um, with their education is important, and importantly, I think also why you, uh, why this is exciting, turning people on to the world of work, that has a far greater um, impact than, be, uh, than another classroom lesson. I'm a great believer that, pe that in large part, you don't teach, people learn, and they learn because they want to learn. And I think in enhancing business school links, improving the quality of careers advice, it, making sure that we are m moving to resolve the literacy and numeracy issues that the minister identified will help. Secondary to that, what happens uh, after 16? I think critically, parity of esteem, developing uh, uh, vocational routes, being less bashful about the strengths of vocational routes. I thought uh, the question from a colleague from, uh, from the Association of Colleges earlier was absolutely spot on. Uh, when we talk about 50% of uh, young people going to university, what that was interpreted as for a decade was 50% of our young people going to th do a three-year residential degree course. 
it'd be much more useful to think about it as 50 per, at least 50% and preferably more of our young people having skills at what is sometimes called degree level, um, although I think that still probably defines it too much in terms of that uh, three-year residential course, uh, whether that is delivered via an apprenticeship in the workplace, via a college course, via um, a learn-while-you-earn arrangement between a business and a university, via the traditional route. There's a lot of work to do there that business is keen to get involved in. So turning to my final comment, what's the appetite in the role of business here? Business is desperate to do more. And you can see that with the kind of work that uh, Morrison's have been very uh, central in in setting up the uh, 16 to 24 alliance. You see that in the kind of involvement people are looking for in uh, this debate. And at the moment, I think that question of brokerage and how businesses can get involved is the one that if we resolve, we could unleash an awful lot of um, commitment and capacity. Now it's Dave Simmons, uh, Chief Executive of Inclusion. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I, uh, well, I hope I uh, address the question, but as ever, I come with points that I want to make, so I'll make them anyway. Um, but I actually started uh, taking your uh, <laughs> subtitle, literally, uh, Shaping Policy for a Job-Rich and Productive Future. Well, what do we mean? Uh, by job rich here. And let's just try and put it in context of where we are as an economy today. So for the sake of argument this morning, let's take the pre-recession <coughs> employment rate as our working definition of job rich. On that basis, come 2015, we will still be 1.2 million jobs short and that's using the OBR projections. That's a long time for high levels of unemployment to persist. In effect, we will still be in that labour market trough seven years after the start of the recession. And especially for young people and areas of high unemployment, it's a major task just to maintain hope, let alone maintain their employability. To put it in a bit of historical context, this is a quote from a, a government report on unemployment that led to Winston Churchill opening the first labour exchange in 1910. The helplessness of the displaced worker left to himself, and of course it was him in those days, left to himself to find employment, leads to aimless wanderings and loiterings often fatal to character. Vague, scanty and imperfect information about where workmen are wanted allows the yearly reinforcement of youth to drift unguided into the confusion. Well, not a lot's changed then, has it? <laughs> that was glib, but because, of course, a lot has changed. And the first point I want to make here is the nature about how we go about uh, job search. And <clears throat> because, the, of course, the... Uh, perfect um, labour market, uh, market economics says that uh, every job seeker can see every employer and every employer can see uh, every job seeker. And of course in 1910 they were realising that just was not true and that they needed to do something to improve it. But now the internet has opened up unimaginable possibilities for transparency uh, in the labour market, and we are only just beginning to realise this power. We have to remember that just in the, in the previous recessions, we were still in the days of unemployed people going into high street shops and looking at little cards uh, in, in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in, in the job centres. So we have to assume that the amount 
of jobs information will no longer be a problem in the future. What will be the problem is how individuals cope with and navigate this mass of information. Not just about jobs, but also taking those vital decisions about careers. What courses do they pursue, uh, et cetera. And for those who are claiming benefits, it will be a world where the majority of transactions for starting a claim, for payments, for meeting responsibilities around signing on and job seeking will be uh, online. And so the majority of, of claimants are likely to find their way and will be empowered by this. But some will be in danger of drifting into the confusion because uh, our flexible labour market will become ever more complex and more competitive. So unless help is given to the most vulnerable, for whatever reason that might be, then we are in danger of entrenching uh, exclusion uh, from work and mainstream society. But again, we need to put this in perspective. Actually, in terms of uh, people becoming long-term unemployed, in this most recent recession, we have halved the rate at which people become long-term unemployed in comparison with previous uh, recession. And I think that is a tribute to not just this government, but also the previous government's set of labour market uh, policies, uh, helping people to move on as quickly as possible. So what needs to happen now? First, we believe that we need to further personalise services to individuals and families. There needs to be an even stronger connection between welfare payments and the responsibility of claimants. But there should be increased choice and freedom about how this is done. This means empowering those people on lower incomes to access the sort of support and mobility the well-off and network-rich job seeker already has access to or will readily buy. You can call these vouchers or accounts or whatever you like, but the principle is that claimants should take more responsibility and have greater freedom and choice about their route to back to work. This especially represents a significant challenge to how Job Centre Plus <coughs> provides its job placement services in the future but an equally large challenge to all those labour market intermediaries, the, the providers, recruitment, agents and, uh, recruitment agencies and so forth, to demonstrate to government and job seekers that a more open market uh, in, in, in uh, job placement can be more effective at finding jobs uh, for the unemployed and reduce long-term unemployment. Second main point is that work experience will need to play a pivotal role in keeping people in touch with work and their skills up to scratch. A, a flexible labour market throws up a wide range of opportunities and it's not our job to double guess where those opportunities may or may not end up. Our job is to make sure that unemployed people have access to those opportunities and grab them if they can. You know, with our help. And <clears throat> the role of employers there is obviously to come forward with those opportunities that are appropriate for, uh, uh, for, uh, to, to provide work experience for unemployed people. And I go back uh, just to the, uh, to the beginnings of the New Deal, where there was a very uh, massive and targeted uh, advertising campaign uh, at uh, employers, which led to thousands of employers coming forward and offering uh, work experience uh, and uh, also uh, subsidised jobs. The problem at that time was there was a massive dysfunction between the range of employers offering uh, opportunities and suitable uh, candidates coming through the New Deal. There was a mismatch and therefore a lot of employers uh, were disappointed uh, with the uh, results. They are lessons that we need to guard against uh, in the future as we are ramping up uh, over the coming years the range of work experience placements. Um, <clears throat> but we have learned in past recessions the consequences of locking people out of the labour market for too long, either through parking them on schemes 
or by moving them onto inactive benefits. Now, I use the word work experience in its widest sense. The spectrum from the uh, placements brokered uh, by Job Centre Plus for the short term unemployed through to temporary jobs as proposed by the uh, advocates of, of job guarantee for the longer term unemployed. Both work, both are cost effective and both need to be used. DWP's latest data on the impact of short spells of work experience shows a positive uh, impact. Uh, <clears throat> but just to put that in, in context, it will mean uh, just 15,000 less people on JSA if the government reaches its target of 250,000 work experience placements. Maybe that's not large, but it's still 15,000 people spending less time on the dole. But there also have to be clear boundaries to make sure that it is a positive experience and not exploitation, uh, lest I sound too much like a uh, Polly Toynbee uh, lefty or a uh, sort of social democrat bourgeois, whatever the liberal. expression was, liberal. Uh, <clears throat> the vast majority of employers that we talk to agree that there need to be those clear boundaries. The work experience needs to be voluntary. Uh, we think it should be limited to six weeks. And there also needs to be a good match between uh, the person coming on the work experience uh, and the employer. And similarly, our analysis of the Future Jobs Fund for long-term unemployed people showed that, they, <coughs> that, uh, that it got more into sustained work. 43% of participants obtained a job outcome after FJF, and over half are predicted to be in the same job uh, one year after starting. We do support a targeted job guarantee for disadvantaged young people, but believe, <coughs> but believe firmly that this must be done through the work programme and not uh, instead of it. And of course, finally, I think uh, it's also important to say uh, <coughs> that uh, progression, uh, once people are in, uh, <coughs> uh, given the opportunity uh, of work experience, uh, given the opportunity to get in as a starter job, then progression is all important. Those route ways uh, through onto apprenticeships uh, and onwards uh, is, is ever uh, critical. So um, finally, I think the work programme has been through uh, testing times recently. A, a payment by results programme is dependent on there being sufficient jobs to get the results, which then means that the providers can get paid. That's the deal between government and providers, <coughs> and providers that are putting their own money up front. But the wider economy is in danger of breaking that deal. Less growth is meaning less jobs. One 1.2 million jobs short to get back to that job-rich future. Work program finances should be responsive to the changes in the economy. And if they are not, the work program is in danger of not delivering its original promise. Thanks. very nicely tees up our, our final speaker, uh, Chris Blackwell, uh, Chief Operating Officer of Indius. I hope I look impressive up here after the uh, <laughs> previous speakers. Um, I'm going to start very quickly with an, an introduction to Indius and an introduction to the work programme. I'll pick up on some of the, the themes that Dave has talked about. Um, Indius UK is the largest work programme provider uh, at the moment, and we deliver services in London, in the east of England, East Midlands, West Midlands, West Yorkshire, North East, North West and Scotland. The work programme covers those most disadvantaged in the labour market. So for people on Job Seekers Allowance, under 24 year olds are referred after nine months of unemployment. For those over 25, they're referred after 12 months of unemployment. So this is the definition of long term unemployed, is, is people uh, referred to the work programme. It also covers those on health and disability benefits uh, who have uh, 
who've been identified as being able to return to work in the short and medium term. And to give you a sense of scale, since June last year, we've had over 160,000 people referred to the work programme, just on the services that INGIUS delivers. Uh, nationwide, that number is probably 650 to 700,000. Currently, INGIUS is, is seeing 14,000 new referrals a month. So in terms of size and scale, um, they're pretty huge numbers. So in talking about the future, I want to keep the present firmly in view. What does a job-rich future suggest about the present? So as Dave said, actually, it's in the title, a jobs-rich future. I don't think it's controversial to say we're not living in a jobs-rich present. However, our experience currently is that there are jobs, and there are tens of thousands of people who have already been supported into work on the work programme. The focus of work programme providers in the present is on, ma on making those most disadvantaged in the labour market as competitive as possible. Uh, so that not only are they able to compete today, but so that they're not disadvantaged in the future. And I think this, this links into one of Dave's points. What do we need to do to meet the challenges and future opportunities of the, uh, meet the challenges and fulfill the opportunities of the future? In past recessions, there have been a huge number of people left behind. And I think Dave's statistic saying that in, in this recession, or the previous recession, uh, starting in 2008, half the number of people have become long-term employed, as has happened in previous recessions. And this already shows the impact of uh, programmes like the Work Programme, programmes like Flexible New Deal and, and, and other previous initiatives, in terms of the impact of keeping people who become short-term unemployed and preventing them from becoming long-term structurally unemployed. However, there is more work to do. How do initiatives like the work programme work alongside business to ensure that as economic growth picks up and as employment grows, everybody gets the benefit? Because this is one of the key questions. How do we ensure that the people who are on the work programme now or the people who are on the work programme in the future are not left behind? And as Dave was talking about the complexity at the moment, the complexity of information. So the, the jobs, the vacancies are much more visible. However, there is a complexity in, in navigating that. That complexity doesn't just exist for the job seekers. It also exists for business and for employers. There are a huge <laughs> number of initiatives at the moment to ensure that actually people aren't left behind. However, if employers don't access those initiatives and don't take up those initiatives, then we won't really see uh, the, get the true benefit. And again, this is something where programmes like the work programme, like some of the initiatives the Minister talked about over apprenticeships, are playing a key role today, but will continue and need to continue to play a key role in the future. Um, we work with thousands of employers currently, small, medium, large employers, and a large part of our role is in connecting them with the supply side, so with the clients who are on the work program, the people who are long-term employed who are looking for work. So we play a dual role, one of educating our clients, what opportunities exist, what are employers looking for, what do they need to do to refresh their skills or to upskill, what attitudes are employers looking for, but we also play a role in educating employers. What exists out there to support you? What exists out there to ensure that you get the right people for your business today and the right people for your business in the future? Now, I don't think it's perfect at the moment. There is a lot of work going on uh, on programmes like the Work Programme and lots of other programmes. But I think, actually, this relationship is, in, is really crucial and needs to go deeper in order for us to take up the opportunities that might come in the future as employment grows. Um, we are really supportive of the government's direction of travel in terms of tying together skills and employment provision more so in the future. We believe this is absolutely right. Um, we believe that it's essential not only for young people, and a lot of the discussion has been about young people, but for those who are currently disengaged from the labour market. So, so not only the 18 to 24 year olds, but you know, somebody who's 27, who's worked for a couple of years, made redundant, and has not been in work for a couple of years. You know, that person, it's really important that they also maintain their skills and that they have investment in their skills for the future. So I guess the final thought is that for the work programme as present, the work programme as future, and other initiatives which work in the same space, whether they're apprenticeships, whether they're, they're employment initiatives, um, 
we need to, to ensure that actually the focus is brought together not only of how to make, help people move into the labour market and secure jobs, but actually how to keep the skills and move forward and progress. So that's uh, my final thought. That leaves us, I think, with about 10 or 15 minutes for, for questions, so perhaps we can, if we can take them in, in bunches of three and then I'll ask the panellists to, to respond to whichever question they find easiest. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's, there was a lady, I think it was you, was it, before, uh, just there, and then one here, and another question, and one right at the back over there, so lady here. Uh, these are the big issues that uh, we're trying to address to your apprentice When looking at young people, what do the panel think that they can do to help those outside the main, the mainstream education system to get the skills? Because a lot of them aren't even within the system. And then there was one. That, yeah. I'm interested in um, the link between frontline demand in the smaller spatial scale, and to what extent to get that supply and demand working well to use local areas to have quite a few jobs as well as the government funds themselves. John, do you fancy tackling some? Yeah, I'll do them in reverse order, um, just to be interesting. Um, the, uh, the supply and demand issue, I mean, I didn't mention this because time, you know, time didn't permit, but of course I launched two weeks ago the National Career Service. And the National Career Service, so very relevant to some of the contributions from other panel members actually, um, is designed to be an all-age service, so not just as Connections was, uh, targeted at young people, but for people of all ages to... Uh, uh, get information on learning or employment or, uh, or training. And uh, that's got a database which we expect to get 20 million hits on a year, uh, a telephone bank which we expect to get a million hits on a year, and we, we anticipate at least three quarters of a million face-to-face -face interviews too. It'll have uh, 3,200 points in England where people can access it. They'll be co-located in Jobs Under Plus, <coughs> in colleges, in third sector organisations, uh, and I think that will play an important point, uh, part in, uh, in, in linking supply and demand. I mean, clearly this is a very big and bold initiative, so it's quite, quite cathartic, and it will take, um, it'll take a while to get it right. I make no bones about that, but it's a very important uh, change. I, I think the last one should have done that. I mean, I, I argued for a very long time for a dedicated all-age service of the kind that already exists in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland uh, for England. And I think that's very important. On, on, the, on the second question, I think, I, think, I think there is more work to be done on pre-apprenticeship training. Uh, I talked a bit earlier about functional illiteracy and the numeracy. And uh, we know, don't we, that there's a very significant proportion of people who don't have the prior attainment to get on to a level two apprenticeship. Uh, I think about six years ago, the House of Lords Economic Affairs Select Committee identified that as a key barrier to, uh, to growing apprenticeships uh, amongst people who are disengaged, that the prior attainment just wasn't sufficient. And I think we do need to do more work and get a better offer on uh, pre-apprenticeship training. We have piloted a pre an access to apprenticeship uh, <coughs> scheme, which I piloted over the last year, 18 months. Uh, but, I, but I think we can do more on that. And I think it's, it's one of the next things I'd like to focus on, actually. Um, and then on the first question, I mean, clearly, uh, the frameworks are defined by employers. Uh, and you know that the occupational standards are defined by SSCs uh, on behalf of employers. And I'd expect the, um, the math and English equivalents, which will usually be embedded, of course, in the training. I mean, that we're talking about functional uh, skills here rather than key skills. I moved away from key skills towards functional skills. So I think it's a very important to link the skill to the practical endeavour, technical or vocational endeavour. Uh, I would expect them to, defi to be defined by, uh, in that process, to be defined as part of the core elements of the framework. 
and um, uh, it will vary from from uh, the reason I, I use work my words quite carefully. I talked about moving towards equivalence because obviously because there are so many frameworks and the embedded skills in them are very particular. Um, it's important that we we don't create is uh, a inhibiting rigidity, but nonetheless. I'm very insistent about getting good measures of equivalence, and we're working very hard on that now. Chris, do you have any thoughts on those questions? Or? Um, I think the, the question about uh, local plans and, and do we need to have detailed <coughs> local plans, absolutely, I think we need to have uh, detailed local plans. But I think one of the challenges uh, for those plans is, is in ensuring that, uh, I, I think one of the risks is that there is lots of different provision in different areas focused on exactly the same people. Mm. And one of the challenges is that they sometimes will work at cross purposes and sometimes they won't link up. So I think one of the challenges for those local plans is actually identifying whether it's uh, how we link in the local authorities, how we link in uh, the work program providers and the other uh, DWP providers with the FE colleges and the skills funding agency providers with the employers because actually there's a wide range of organisations focused on exactly the same people, but working in ignorance of the other organisations working with those people. And I think that is a big challenge within the system. And I think it's, it's definitely improving, but I, should, I don't think we should underestimate the challenge of that. Um, um, yeah, two quick points. Um, first of all, on the, on the uh, smaller areas, and maybe this is a um, you know, bigger area than you're thinking of, but... Uh, local enterprise uh, partnerships, you know, are actually part of their purpose uh, <coughs> is there to actually sort of drive uh, <coughs> not just the uh, enterprise bit, the economic development bit, but also they have within their brief, you know, general oversight of, of employment and skills, and some take it more seriously uh, than others. And what we would like to see is a, a far more, if you like, holistic view by local enterprise uh, partnerships that can, can really start at the local level to knock heads together along the lines uh, that, that Chris was saying uh, that was needed. Uh, I mean, yes, it's important still for ministers to do that at the national level, but I think if employers are doing it through the LEPs at the more local level, uh, then, then that is uh, some uh, sort of hopefully um, have have greater uh, an immediate impact. Uh, also, we shouldn't forget that the whole community budgeting process uh, is it's sort of faltering. Uh, right ideas, the the intention is again to be pooling those sort of relevant budgets together. Not quite got that head of steam but we still believe got a lot of potential for how you link up all of these different budgets and agencies for the most disadvantaged areas and, and, the, and the people uh, living there. On young people uh, <coughs> outside of the mainstream, yes, there are too many still that are, if you like, the genuine uh, needs. Um, we believe that, uh, that uh, the one, uh, one way, uh, and, and it, it might sound like rearranging deck chairs again, um, but at the moment we've got you know, half a dozen uh, national uh, and, uh, and local agencies, bodies, uh, that uh, have got some sort of responsibility for 16 to 24-year-olds. Uh, we think that there should be... Uh, a far more, uh, a, a, a simpler, uh, clearer, single uh, organisation agency that is responsible for it. We call it the youth, uh, <coughs> youth employment and skills. Yes, for short. Um, <coughs> um, but you know, basically, its its objective is to help young people in that transition from work. It's there to improve their skills and get them on the road. Uh, to work. And I think with, with a more focused, uh, with less uh, cracks to fall between, uh, <coughs> then uh, I, uh, I, I think that uh, that would start to redress what is actually a very entrenched problem. No government, really, uh, over the last sort of 20 years uh, has actually got 
to the bottom uh, of, of really sorting out the uh, needs. So some more radical thinking, I'm afraid, is, is, is needed to, to, to tackle. Yeah. Um, I think a lot has been said on the question of local areas already. I, I think I mentioned local brokerage in my comments, and I think that's an important part of this. And let's have a role to play. It's joining up uh, budgets, joining up analyses, the critical challenge that hasn't already been mentioned is the importance of that being employer-led. The one risk we see sometimes in this local analysis is local, uh, the local political agenda being about supplying the skills we would like to have rather than the ones that are actually instrumental in the economic development of the region. And, and that's something which we need to be alive to. But that local uh, focus has to be the right one. And actually, within that focus, that's probably the right framework to, ma to be making sure that you're reaching out to those who are outside the system as well. On the subject of um, equivalence, um, I think employers have been extremely clear on what they mean by functional literacy and numeracy for work. Uh, there are some very clear ideas of what the understanding uh, employers expect us. And we did some work uh, for DFES uh, three or four years ago, uh, before the last election, that, that made that clear. I think just one final comment, which is a support for uh, the Minister's comments about pre-apprenticeships. When we did our big piece of work on youth unemployment last year, the thing that affected me personally most, uh, coming as I do with a family history in Greenock and Clyde Bank, um, was talking to the remaining surface shipyards on the Clyde about their apprenticeships, and they offer fantastic apprenticeship opportunities. Um, okay, uh, the carrier program only lasts for so long, but these are top quality engineering apprenticeships. And they said the problem is that we are sitting in a community in Govan that has supplied our workforce for almost 100 years, and we get literally no applications that are successful because people just aren't reaching the standards. And in, in some of those workplaces, we are seeing kids from more affluent areas of Glasgow getting the apprenticeship simply because we're not getting the kids in, uh, up to the entry level for apprenticeship through the education mm. system. Mm. And that's why we think the education system has to be a big focus mm. as well as the vocational uh, routes post-16. I'm going to be very rude again and ask my own question. Um, so a lot of the focus today so far has been on young people. Um, and Dave, I was particularly interested about your discussion about basically outlining that actually young people have always been a problem. And we haven't really tackled that since 1910. So you know, what more can we do now? And I think part of my worry is that actually, with a strong focus on young people, we're kind of forgetting the other end of the labour market, the older workers. Uh, we published some stats today showing that actually, it's the older workers who are struggling much more to get into work. And they actually have much larger scars in terms of their future prospects for employment and their wages. And so wondering whether the minister could outline, perhaps, you know, any thoughts about retraining you know, skills for older workers, or what kind of uh, tools we could try and, try and do to make, to make older workers who have left work more employable in the future? Well, I mean, the... the, the uh huh. yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, um, well, I mean, let me deal with that one head on then, and I'll come back to the, to the, to the first part of the question. Um, when we set out the strategy in 2010, of course, we, we identified uh, that for people at level three, over 24, there would be a loan scheme equivalent to the HE loan scheme. So the same rate of interest, the same repayment uh, process, the same income contingent uh, criteria. Uh, and and uh, we're looking to phase that in, as you know. Uh, it, will expect, it will affect a, a very small proportion of FE learners. I mean, uh, we are looking at the figures yesterday. But nonetheless, an important uh, section. And I'm working with uh, the sector, I, I was uh, in two meetings about this yesterday, actually, um, not solely about this, but where this was raised and we talked about it, to look at how we can package that product in the most attractive possible way so that people know that because FE uh, learners will typically be very much less than HE learners, okay, that this, is really, this represents a really good investment. We're looking to see how we can through individual learning accounts, which I've also, as you know, uh, 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 been involved in, uh, in uh, working on over the time of the minister, um, look at how employers might be able to contribute, uh, because there's, there's no reason why employers couldn't support learners 
through that process. And I'm confident that we will be able to package this in a way which doesn't deter significant numbers of people from engaging in learning. But I do think there are particular groups of learners that we need to do more work on. And I'll give you an example. Um, uh, women returners who are looking for access courses in FE before moving into HE. Uh, I don't want them to be detrimentally affected as an unintended consequence of the policy. So I'm looking, for example, closely at what more we can do to make uh, to address their, their needs. That's what a particular group. I wouldn't want any group that's already underrepresented in the learning system to be worse off as a result of this change. And I'm looking at what we can do there too. But of course, in the end, you know, this is part of the CSR, we had to make judgments about what we, uh, how we funded learning. And the great debate in FE that's pre prevailed, certainly since I've been involved, is who pays for what? What do employers pay? What do the government pay? And what do individuals pay towards their learning? And that's a debate that we need to, to, to in the end, reconcile. We need to come to a conclusion about. And this is part of that process, frankly. Um, you know, I've heard those arguments put for a long time. You know, employers should pay more or less, or the money the government's going to be targeted more directly, and, and what about individuals contributing their own learning? And this is part of that catharsis. Um, so that's what I think about that. On the older learners, I mean, interestingly, the, I mean, we've seen very big growth of post-25 uh, on apprenticeships. And some people have been quite critical of that. Some, it's a very ironic. Some people think I'm going far too far on quality, you know, that I'm being far too demanding, far more demanding than any previous government, and that that would deter people, employers and, and apprentices. And other people say we're too permissive, you know, that we're allowing all these, these post-25 apprentices, and what we should actually be doing is inhibiting that uh, uh, because in the interests of, of younger people. We've seen growth uh, of about 30% um, in 16 to 18 apprenticeships over two years. We've seen growth of about 70% uh, in 19 to 24. But we've seen biggest growth, albeit from a low base, uh, in post-25 apprenticeships. And that's really about people upskilling and reskilling, a lot of them already in the workforce. But I haven't got a problem with that. That's, a, that's an absolute deliberate part of my policy. Uh, Leach argued that unless we did that, we'd never catch up. Do you remember when, uh, when, Brown, uh, when Gordon Brown commissioned Leach? Leach argued that unless we found mechanisms to effectively upskill and reskill the existing workforce, we would never catch up with our competitors in terms yeah. of skills. Because there just aren't enough new people coming into the workforce. And even if you skill them uh, sufficiently, you can't compensate for the inadequacy of skills deeper into the workforce. Mm. So I'm, I'm not terribly apologetic about the opportunities for older learners. In fact, I'm rather proud that we're creating those opportunities for people to improve and gain and, and acquire, uh, acquire new skills. And as part of that CSR that I referred to earlier, I made an absolute uh, line in the sand decision that we defend adult and community learning against all expectations, by the way. You remember that John Denham once described it as mainly holiday Spanish. Uh, another problem for the bourgeois left in that they've become so determined only ever to defend your learning on the basis of utility. <laughs> but I believe in the power of learning and the power of adult and community learning to enrich lives and enrich communities. And we defended it, and, and not only defended it, we maintained the budget, protected the budget for the first time. And uh, so I'm a great enthusiast for learning for adults. On that positive note for me, certainly, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the session. Um, there are refreshments outside. Um, yeah. The next session, there's a choice of sessions, I think, in here and next door, and another room, so do choose which one you want to go to, and that kicks off 11.30. I'd like to thank the panellists before everyone leaves in the usual way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, great session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.